Mr. Richard? Oh. Huh? Oh. You know, when watching King of the Hill, you're gonna run into a lot of characters throughout the show. The ones with a lot of book smarts, the ones with a lot of street smarts, the ones with a lot of common sense, and all in between. Well, uh, this one is Jimmy Witcher. Well, if you work for Jimmy, you're gonna work hard. People up there are hot and dry. They want someone cold and wet. You do your job, you make money, but you work hard. Because that's the way you work if you want to work for Jimmy. Yeah, so how can I describe Jimmy Witcher without coming off as offensive or offending anyone? Uh, I guess you could say he's uh, somewhat functionally disabled. Uh, a less polite term would say he's special or even regarded. And no, I'm not talking about the uh, dictionary's definition of regarded. Unlike other King of the Hill characters, there is clearly something wrong with Jimmy, explained later by Dale later on in the episode, seeing as that he only appears in one or two episodes and a cameo at best, it's unclear whether or not he has assisted living, or if he lives in a group home, or if he can live on his own. I'm not going to be making any cheap jokes about his disabilities, and just simply let his own actions speak for themselves, as some of his moments are rather funny. Again, not making fun of him for his learning or mental disabilities, it's just the way the show presented him throughout the series, as this sort of oddball doing weird things like collecting cans and whatnot, which I understand if some of you guys might not like the way they portray Jimmy Witcher or how they represent uh, mental disabilities. But with that being said, let's get on to Life in the Fast Lane, Bobby Saga. We begin the episode with Boomhauer driving up to a stoplight as an obvious police officer initiates the drag race as they both wait for the light to turn green. They both speed off, and when Boomhauer takes the lead, the officer puts his light on his car and pulls him over. Obviously, he's a cop. I mean, you should have seen this coming a mile away. You are a Texas Ranger, aren't you? I mean, if Boomhauer was a Texas Ranger and not just a retcon at the very end, he would have absolutely have pushed his authority and told him, hey, I'm a Texas Ranger. You can't get me a ticket. But I guess he's not one in this episode. Good evening, sir. Do you know why I pulled you over? Because you beat me. I want a rematch. Not here. This is a school zone. There's an amateur race at the Speedway this weekend. Winner gets to drive the pace car when NASCAR comes to town. Using his natural linguistic skills, he expresses his excitement about driving a pace car during a NASCAR race, and the officer hands him a piece of paper with a date and time, and also hits his pale light, saying he'll let that one slide. Now, you see, I'd keep going on about... The retcon about Boomhauer being a Texas Ranger, or that just being a fake badge to get ladies. But I think it's kind of interesting how this is ultimately the B-plot, as Bobby's saga, or Bobby working for Jimmy Witcher, kind of takes the front stage the moment Bobby is introduced to Jimmy Witcher. Hank and the gang are working on Boomhauer's car to get it ready for the big race, as the fuel mixture is too rich, causing the motor to combust. Dale using it to light a cigarette. As Bill is struggling to get out of the car, having some trouble. I mean, it's Bill after all. Maybe if Bill would lay off all those sweets he loves so much, he might be able to get out of the car easier. Meanwhile, Bobby rolls up on his bike and hands Hank a check for $175 for him to write for the bike barn to get him a new bike. These checks aren't magic tickets. They represent real money that I and to a lesser extent your mother, work real hard to earn. Even with all the jobs Peggy has held, from substitute teacher to a uh, real estate agent, and even writing for the Ireland bystander, Hank thinks that his propane money is like 90% of the house's income, while Peggy trails behind with a tin. Peggy Hill is seen taking away a flytrap, which is a pretty interesting design, as her and Luann gush about Jeff Gordon and how he's the world's fastest Christian. Meanwhile, Hank talks about how he's a bad influence on Bobby, and that he has no concept on how money management or anything costs. How much do you think those shorts you're wearing cost? I don't know. They're pretty nice. A hundred dollars? Hmm. A hundred dollars for a pair of cotton short pants. You say that now, but after inflation, then these days, those pants could well be in the hundreds. 
Hank Hill makes a not so wise decision and describes Buck Strickland as someone to live by, saying he only started his propane business with a dollar, giving Bobby one dollar. And I can't imagine what he's gonna do with that. Hank pulls up, seeing Bobby hunched over from the front door like the first zombie you meet in Resident Evil, and thinks he has a shoe shiny business only to find. Bobby! You almost made me drop it! This is what you spent your- Oh yeah, because Bobby's really gonna get a shoe shining business and not a gigantic burrito and a quesadilla for just one dollar? Are you kidding me? I'd get that too! While Hank and Peggy argue that Bobby should be learning more responsibilities when Peggy's saying that he's a kid, he should enjoy himself while Bobby makes on, his goofy Bobby. face You're when he's about to eat the burrito, the taking Bobby to the race car track, where the events of this episode, and by events I mean Bobby's saga, will really begin. At the Arlen Speedway, Bobby and Hank are walking around as Boomhauer gets his application to sign in for the race to qualify to ride the pace car. And as much as some of you guys probably really like this story of Boomhauer finally being able to drive a pace car in a NASCAR race, I'm just not really interested in it. Kind of like the B-plot with uh, the uh, Arlen Flood episode with the uh, Bobby and them. I'm not interested in the gang this time. So yeah, let's focus on Bobby and Jimmy Wichard and let's cut back to the boys every now and again, but let's not focus the entire review on that B-plot. The pace car, Bobby. It's what Boomhauer gets to drive if he wins his amateur race. What's a pace car? Well, it's the car that all the other drivers have to stay behind at the beginning of a race or whenever there's a crash. If Boomhauer wins, he'll have the honor of driving on the same track as Dale Earnhardt. Or, as you'd look at it, with Jeff Gordon. As Hank explains more about the pace car, he sees a boy about Bobby's age walking around with a soda holder and calls him over. Hey, soda's here. Get your sodas. Hey, I'll take one. Nice hustle, son. I can rest when I'm dead, sir. You hear that, Bobby? That is a good attitude. That's what Mr. Witcher told us. He's my boss. If only Hank knew just how miserable Tommy is, he would have never suggested working for Jimmy in the first place. But then again, that wouldn't have been a very entertaining episode. Hank makes a comment saying maybe one day Bobby can work there, and Tommy's like, maybe today, because he's so eager to throw that job he has at Bobby because he's so miserable and can't stand working for Jimmy Richard. Oh, what was that? How can he be so bad? I'll let his first appearance to Hank and Bobby be the shining example of what I'm talking about. Richard, I wonder if you have an opening for my son Bobby here. Well, if you work for Jimmy, you're gonna work hard. People up there are hot and dry. They want something cold and wet. You do your job, you make money, but you work hard. Because that's the way you work if you want to work for Jimmy. So, if I understand you correctly, you're saying you'll teach my boy the value of a dollar. If you work for Jimmy, you're gonna work hard. You make money. The people are hot and dry. That sounds just fine. This is gonna be a great experience for- Look, I'm not saying Hank's an expert in mental health and mental disabilities. But he should have seen what Jimmy was doing as two red flags. He was repeating verbatim everything he said like it was some kind of script for new people. And also, he, he's doing this fidgeting thing with his wrist and he's looking around. I'm not an expert either, so if anyone knows that kind of uh, thing he's doing, let me know in the comments. Bobby tells Tommy that if he works hard enough, his dad says he'll be another Buck Strickland. And Tommy doesn't really give a shit about that before handing him the soda cart and jumping over the fence. Giving us the second red flag about this being a bad idea. But, you know, episodes got an episode. Hank is excited for Bobby to start his new day working for Jimmy Wichard as Peggy takes pictures on her old portable camera and tells him that if there's any crashes to take lots of pictures, which is messed up. Can you imagine if Peggy had a side job taking pictures for faces of death? I mean, it's kind of messed up, but I don't know. Good work. Bobby is excited to start his new day. He sees another person working and gives him the thumbs up as the kid gives him the look of a battled veteran seeing another fresh meat enter the gladiator's den to be slaughtered. As someone wants peanuts, he throws it and it hits Lady in the face. I think what makes this scene funny is, aside from her reacting to being hit by the bag of peanuts, she doesn't really give any response other than that. Someone way up in the nosebleed wants a soda, 
as he makes his way up, getting caught by Bubblegum, getting bleached on by the sun, only to find out that that's not diet. Oh, sorry, gotta make your way downstairs, Bobby. Oh no, someone stole all the drinks. Well, better sit down and take a picture of the crash for Peggy. Okay, I will admit, that is a pretty funny scene. Despite everything going on, him still being able to take a picture for Peggy is still kind of sweet and adorable. Bobby restocks the soda carrier as Jimmy offers him a hot dog. All right. $4.50 for a jumbo dog and $20 for a tray of stolen drinks and the $28 you owed me. Now you owe me, oh yeah, you owe me $52.50, Tommy. You see, this is the problem with Jimmy. He doesn't understand numbers. He has this little booklet, which is probably his routine, and anything that goes against his routine, he outright refuses. Also, the fact that he refused to pay Bobby because he quote-unquote thinks he owes him money. So, uh, it just goes to show that people with Jimmy's kind of mental handicaps should not be running something like this. Now, I'm not saying people with mental handicaps can't have jobs. They can, and they do very well. If... They can do stuff they can handle. Jimmy is good at refilling the sodas and stuff. He seems to be more like a worker rather than a manager like Hank. Now, Dale and Bill don't have disabilities, but they are known to be rather uh, incompetent. And I'm sorry that I'm not going to focus most of the episode on the B-plot. I just want to focus mostly on Bobby Saga and Jimmy Wichard. Which, the episode is up for you guys to watch and enjoy. I do highly recommend checking out this episode before watching this review, as it is really funny. As Bobby puts his soda tray away, he sees a sight he never will forget. Gasp! Mr. Wichard, how dare you expose Bobby to such unusual hot doggery? Well, you may not care about sophisticated hot doggery to us, our hot dogs have a first name. It's O S C A R. How dare you? Mr. Richard, I think I'm ready to go. Okay. You owed me $68 in trays, and you paid me $72, but you also owed me $40 for a total of you owing me $88,000. $88, <sighs> I'm not gonna say anything about his mental disabilities. Clearly he doesn't understand math. $68 minus 72 plus 40 is 36. Not 88888 whatever you just said. Besides, Bobby doesn't owe you anything. Bobby pedals his way back home. Hank Hill waiting for him, playing his guitar. A regular scene from Little House on the Prairie as Bobby sits down with Hank, finally being able to enjoy a root beer, just like his old man. I know this is me probably overthinking things, but how long do you think Hank was waiting just to have that moment with Bobby, you know, drinking a, a beer and Bobby drinking a root beer? It, it just I know it's a very adorable scene, but it just shows that Hank was excited to hear all about Bobby's day. Unfortunately, well, the day didn't go exactly as planned. You can say yep, too. You've earned it. Dad, I want to quit. <laughs> what? Quit? Hank, look, I get you're upset that he wants to quit his job, but don't take his root beer away. It's hot, and the tray is heavy, and my boss is really mean, and he calls me Tommy, and he watches TV and a hot dog, and I think he might be a moron. Now, Bobby, I know your first day was hard, but don't call your boss names. Okay, so in defense of Hank, he doesn't know Jimmy Wichard and doesn't know exactly who he is until Dale lets him know, which he actually knows Jimmy. And all of Bobby's complaints, whether justified, if you take it from his point of view, are seen as just complaining from Hank's, because he knows Bobby and knows he isn't exactly the most, uh, dedicated person so hearing Bobby say this is probably gonna make Hank think that he's just complaining about the job however he gives him some pretty good advice and honestly it it would it, it would be good advice unless we're talking about Jimmy Wichard here remember a good salesman always says yes to the boss 
He approaches every task with a can-do attitude. And when things get tough, he shrugs it off and sings a happy tune. This is that thing about me giving 110%, right? Now again, I'm conflicted on this because on the one hand, that's very true. You need to take jobs with a can-do attitude and always say yes. However, if we're talking about people like Jimmy Richard, who are going to abuse that and make him do just constant, constant manual labor with no monetary reward or no money, then yeah, that's wrong. Also, this very adorable scene from Hank. If you weren't my son, I'd hug you. Now that Bobby had that little pep talk with Hank, he returns to Jimmy with a new mindset, eager to win his approval and ultimately prove to Jimmy that he's a better worker. Bobby comes back rejuvenated, giving 110%, already handing out three trays of food and snacks, and tells him that he admits that he didn't think Jimmy was a good boss at first, but meanwhile telling him that he's going to be a better worker, and that he's going to show him that he's a good worker, meanwhile Jimmy just regurgitates the same, I'm the boss, you work for me, crap, saying that he doesn't listen to Bobby. Also, Jimmy is, again, best suited as a worker like Bobby, maybe filling up drink trays, putting food, setting up uh, trays for the kids to run out. Maybe he could be a supervisor of that and not a, a manager or a boss managing other workers. Jimmy isn't an incompetent worker. He's just an incompetent boss. How would you want to be my go-to guy? That's me. Okay, first of all, it's how'd you like to be my go-to guy, Jimmy? Come on, grammar. And second of all, yay, yeah, 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 go go-to guy. You get the work straight from Jimmy. Now, what does that entail? First, you go to the men's room and mop out the unerals. Then, you go to my cigarettes in my car. Then, go to back here. Can do. Now, I see, having a mindset like this is good, but for situations like this, it's not. People like Jimmy are going to use you and use you and use you and keep you right where they are, not promoting you or sending you somewhere else because they like you right there. So having a go-to mindset isn't always the best solution for situations like this. Let's say, for example, Hank and the gang have a business. Hank would obviously be the boss, Boomhauer would be uh, a rank below, and Dale and Bill will be the same because they're both at that same level of... Uh, they can't do much because they get in the way, and they just have that same kind of incompetence that Jimmy has. Not saying that Dale and Bill are dumber than Jimmy or in the same level. I'm just saying we know from past experiences that Bill and Dale aren't exactly leader material, and they need someone like Hank to keep them in line so they don't mess up anything. Besides, we all know Hank Hill has all these nuggets of wisdom that he can tell people. Find the job nobody wants. And then, do it better. I'll do it. Better. Boomhauer gets ready for his race. As you see the cop familiar, doing a mirroring effect from the beginning of the episode. Ah, but you're not interested in that. You're interested in the crazy tale of Bobby and Jimmy Wizard. Can't say no to the boss. And I'm the boss. See? So put on the hot dog, you. No way. You put it on. I'll do it, Mr. Wizard. Okay, I'm not gonna ask why Bobby was trouncing around the dumpster, probably doing something for Jimmy, maybe getting some aluminum cans, because later episodes, Jimmy does get obsessed with collecting aluminum cans and making sculptures out of them. Bobby volunteers to put on the hot dog costume. How come you keep wanting to do things nobody wants to do? Because I've got a can-do attitude, boss. My dad says there's no limit to what a guy with a can-do attitude can do. Maybe one day I'll even have your job. Now, a normal boss would be happy to know that someone's so dedicated that one day, if that person would retire, they take over. However, Jimmy doesn't see it that way. The rest of my job? Yes, sir. You think you're so good? You put on the suit. You put on the suit now. Now, you may be wondering, where's Hank Hill in all this mess? Well, while Hank sings praises about Bobby being a good worker, we see Bobby being mocked and ridiculed while wearing the hot dog suit, singing a little song. You know, because that's what Hank told Bobby to do. Oh, but that's not important. Hank is more worried about Boomhauer winning the race and driving a pace car during a NASCAR race. What are you doing up? It's 5.30 in the morning. 
Jimmy wants me to strain the bugs out of the fryer before the oil gets too hot. Now you see, this is something that Jimmy absolutely can do and is capable of doing, but since he's lazy and incompetent, he makes a kid do it. But I'm sure Hank wouldn't possibly let Bobby do something this dangerous. Find what your niche is. That leads to riches. Oh yeah, thanks Hank for that nugget of wisdom. I suppose Bobby will have to go to work and strain the bugs out of the fryer before it gets too hot, saying that he still thinks Jimmy Witcher just ain't right, before Hank runs off to join the others. Also, I'm sorry that it has nothing to do episode, but my god, that running animation is just so hilarious. I mean, I get it, it's not easy animating something running away, but just <laughs> replay that a few times, it's hilarious. We see Jimmy over here stressing out over nothing, saying there's a lot of people talking to someone, probably in the same mental capacity, about them needing drinks before calling Bobby. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Tommy about needing drinks. Meanwhile, there is a really cute moment with Loanne and Peggy that I really need to mention. So, okay, we wave this sign around and Jeff Gordon sees it. Then he comes up to us in the stands and is so taken by our charms that he asks one of us to marry him. Well, honey, it probably won't be me. I have got a ring on my finger. Yeah, and big feet. I'm only ignoring that because a man is on fire. I'm glad we can take a moment from Jimmy Witcher's incompetence to give us this cute scene with Peggy and Luann. We return back to the other plot lines as they cross. Hank asking Bobby just in time as they get a soda. And before everyone starts complaining, Hank buys. Which is... Also nice of Hank. And also lets Hank see the kind of quality of soda that Jimmy lets Bobby, Bobby sell. These sodas are hot. Saying that it's too so hot and that they should really efficient. work on a way to, to help transport the sodas. Tell you what to not do. knowing that Jimmy okay. doesn't know how to. And Bobby's not going to know how to transport soda and keep them cold. While telling Bobby to listen to his boss Jimmy Witchard, Dale finally informs Hank on who he is. Witchard? Jimmy Witchard? You told Bobby to listen to Jimmy Witchard? He was in my gun club. People say he fried his brain one day just staring at the sun. Of course, he couldn't have been too smart to do that in the first place. It's kind of a chicken egg thing. Oh, uh, what's that, Hank Hill? You're looking back at all the stuff you told Bobby? Find your niches, that's where your riches. And, oh, do a job and do it better. Realizing you told that about someone like Jimmy Witchard? Who fried his brain staring at the sun? <sighs> Make me thirsty. I need a soda. Hey! Hey, you! Yeah. Tommy! I'm not even going to talk about how illogical that is. Meanwhile, he makes Bobby get him a drink. And if you think Jimmy Wichard's incompetence was harmless, well... That's Mr. Wichard. Not that way, just run across! What the track? Do it, you, you monkey boy! I'm the boss of you! Bobby, don't do it! Hank, where are you? Bobby's gonna run across the track! Thankfully, Hank sees Bobby before he starts running out and stops him before he does anything stupid. I'm gonna cross the track and bring Mr. Witcher to soda. That's crazy. I'm giving 110%, Dad. Go to here, go to boy! I want a soda! Go to now, you! Oh. Finally, Hank, you now see the truth about Jimmy Witcher. Go get him! Go get him and kick his ass, I'll tell you what. Hank Hill runs across the track, dodging many cars, even causing Jeff Gordon to drive off the track, causing an accident, which, in fact, leads Boomhauer to be able to drive the pace car. It's good to have a resolution to the B story before the main story gets finished up, as Hank goes to try and attack Jimmy, him thinking he's safe just because he's in between a cat's fence, not knowing who he's messing with. Hank kicks through the fence, and proceeds to go and finally kick his ass. A moment immortalized forever as Peggy takes pictures of it. This will definitely be far more memorable than any crash NASCAR could offer. Hank apologizes to Bobby about Jimmy and wanting to pay him the money that he's owed from working there. Bobby, you worked harder this month than any guy on this block, and I want to give you the money you earned. Dad, I don't want money. I was happy before when you just bought all the stuff around here and there was no money involved. I'm not a big fan of how this episode ended because Bobby was supposed to learn the value of a dollar 
And obviously working for Jimmy Witchard, who wasn't going to pay him, he is going to learn that, especially six seasons down the road when he thinks Hank's a millionaire, you would think that this is the opportunity for Hank to teach him the value of a dollar. Even going as far as declining a few hundred dollars from Hank, just wanting a couple of pairs of short pants, and they'll call it even. Ending the episode on a happy note, I guess you could say, but for me, it just shows that Bobby didn't really learn anything about the importance of a dollar or any of that because one, he was working with an incompetent boss named Jimmy, whom I tried my best to not make fun of him for his obvious mental disabilities, but it was important that Bobby learned the value of a dollar because that was the whole point of him getting the job to begin with, to learn the value of a dollar and to understand what things cost. And yeah, Hank's views were kind of misguided, but still, there was a reason for why Bobby needed a job. But again, Bobby is still 13, I believe, at this point in the episode. And he'll learn as he grows up. Anyways, guys, that's the episode. Don't forget to like, share, comment, do all that good stuff. What'd you think of this episode? And let me know what you thought of uh, Bobby and learning the importance of a dollar. If it was important that he learned it at that age, uh, which side you... Uh, side with Hank or Peggy and with that being said thanks for watching I'll see you guys next time when you visit the Ellery again and I give my hoot in the dark thank you so much for watching join the parliament of hoots today and hit the bell to let you know when I go live or my next video is up don't forget to like the video and share with your fans let me know what you guys think of this episode in the comment section below. Check out these two videos, it'll take you to more of my content. Don't forget to follow me on my other platforms, Twitter and PlayStation Network. I might get a Twitch sometime, but in the near future. Until then, thank you guys so much for watching as I gave my hoot in the dark.